Good morning. I'm delighted to, to be back with you. Uh, Chelsea and I had uh, a profitable time out in Nevada for the, the gospel meeting that I was invited to do, and uh, we're just grateful to, to be back home. I do have to admit I'm a, a little bit jet lagged. Uh, we were out in Pacific time, and so uh, I woke up this morning at about uh, 5 a.m. Uh, according to what I was was used to, uh, but uh, we're We'll adjust. We'll get back to it. Uh, but we're glad to, to be back with you. Uh, we're grateful for our visitors. We have quite a few uh, with us this morning, and we're grateful for your presence. And we'd invite you to, to come back any time that you have the opportunity. Uh, we'll be meeting again this evening at 6.30 for another period of worship, as well as 7 o'clock on Wednesday for a period of Bible study. Uh, so if you have opportunity, please come back and... Uh, We'd be delighted to have you. This morning, I'd like to talk about one of the parables of Jesus. And that parable is the parable of the unmerciful slave. I think that there's a lot of things that we can learn from this parable that really have a great impact in our, on our lives. And so let's talk about that this morning. But before we jump into the parable, it is important that we get its context. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And look at verse 21. Matthew 18 verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Jesus has been talking in this chapter about what you should do if, if your, your brother stumbles. He first talks about uh, the idea uh, of being converted and becoming like children, the idea of humility. And also talking about not offending or not make, causing your brother to stumble. Uh, he talks about how we should go out if our brother does stumble. Uh, as uh, a shepherd with a hundred sheep, the, the 99 plus one, but that one goes and strays. And the shepherd goes and looks for that one. That's how we should view our, our, our brother who has stumbled. And then he gives some, some practical um, instruction about what to do if your brother sins, how you should go to him one-on-one, -on -one, but then take two, uh, one or two so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established, but then after that, take it to the church. And then we come to this idea that Peter asks, he says, how often should I forgive my brother? And it's in that context that he's asking this question about, well, your, your brother stumbles, what if your brother sins against you? And how often should I forgive him? And Peter seemingly makes a generous offer. He says, should I forgive him up to seven times? <laughs> At least maybe that's what he thinks, that he's being generous. But Jesus says, no, not up to seven times, up to 70 times seven. Seven is a complete number. It's used that way in the scriptures many times. And so maybe that's why Peter uses the idea of seven. But, but Jesus takes that number and turns it on its head. Seventy times seven. That's seven times ten times seven. He, he completely expands it. And if you were to take this literally, that's 490 times. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is taking another number, 10, which also is an idea of completeness and totality. And so 7 times 10 times 7 is the idea of complete and total, uh, just almost an infinite number, is what Jesus is trying to say. And so Jesus, once again, challenges his disciples, in this case, Peter, to think beyond what they are willing to do. To push beyond that. But we have a, 
implicit question here. Why? Why should we forgive our brother? Not just up to seven times, not just up to 70 times seven. Why, why would we forgive our brother at all? And that's where this parable comes in. Start reading with me in verse 23 of Matthew 18. <clears throat> For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had, and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. The first thing that we want to notice about this passage, this parable, is the massive debt that this slave owns. 10,000 talents, as if you were to, to reckon that, uh, uh, you understand that a denarii is a day's wage and a, a talent is much more than that. We're looking at about 200,000 years of work. If you worked every day for the next 200,000 years, you'd have 10,000 talents. Or if you wanted to put a dollar amount on that, taking a, an average income of, of a person and, and multiplying that out, that's about $3.48 billion. $3.48 billion that this slave owed. Now you could get into, why does he owe that much money? He probably was a poor steward. So many things that you could talk about with that, but all we're left with is he owes an insurmountable debt. And you notice that as the master is looking to settle accounts, he brings the slave before him and he commands that this slave and his wife and his children and his possessions be sold to, to satisfy that debt. So a pronouncement of judgment has been made upon this slave. But then we see the slave's desperation. The slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you everything. His wife and his children and all his possessions and he himself are going to be sold. And so he humbles himself before his master. And he doesn't, you notice his attitude. He doesn't say, well, I have just no way of repaying this debt. You know, woe is me. No, he says, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. Now, did he have a realistic chance of doing that? No. No, he did not. And maybe he realized that. But he's begging for mercy from his master and he intends to pay it back. At least that's the, the words that he uses. And so his master has compassion on him. His master has mercy upon him and doesn't just say, no, I'm not going to sell you, but rather he released him from being a slave and he forgave him his debt. Again, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of a big debt. And he said, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay. It's an amazing thing that the master does. Continue reading with me in verse 28. We read about the slave's lack of mercy. In verse 28, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. <clears throat> 
So this slave apparently has another debt that is owed to him. It's a hundred denarii. That's a hundred days worth of labor, or if you were to, to put that in a dollar amount, again, based on a, an average income, you're looking at about $5,800. That's not a small debt, but it's not near what the first slave owed, not even close. It is definitely repayable. But you'll notice a, a difference between this slave, the one who had been forgiven the, the massive amount of debt, and, and his master and, and how they deal with things. This slave was brought before his master and the master pronounced judgment, commanded that these things be done, but he did not do anything inhumane, anything cruel to this slave. And he was patient in the proceedings. This slave immediately goes up to this other slave and begins to choke him. Begins physically uh, abusing him and hurting him. Saying, pay back what you owe. And so he immediately delves into to the, the punishment, the condemnation, rather than having... You could say a, a trial of sorts. <clears throat> and then we see this other slave's desperation. He falls to the ground. He prostrates himself before the unmerciful slave and says, have mercy with me and I will pay back, uh, have patience with me and I will pay back everything that I owe. The same exact words that the first slave said to his master. The same exact behavior that the first slave showed to his master. And yet, we see a completely different response. The unmerciful slave takes him and throws him into prison until he can pay off that debt. Now, based on what happened to him, you could say the proper response was for him to forgive that debt. And yes, that would be reasonable. But even if he were unwilling to do that, he could have at least had patience with him. He could have at least given him more time to pay off the debt. But he's unwilling to even do that. He throws him into prison. Until he pays off the debt. How, how are you going to make money from prison? The answer is you don't. He's putting this slave, his fellow slave, in an unwinnable position. It's likely that that slave will be stay in prison for the rest of his life. Continue reading with me in verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. First thing I want to notice is the other slaves, his fellow slaves. It says that they saw what had happened and they were deeply grieved and came reported it to their Lord all that had happened. This affected them as well. They couldn't believe what they had just seen. They perhaps knew what had happened between him and, and, and their master. And they were shocked. They were grieved. 
Second thing that we want to note is indeed the master's fury. It said that he was moved with anger over what this slave had done. He had just forgiven this insurmountable debt. And this slave turns around not even seemingly completely forgetting what had been done. And he shows great cruelty toward one of his fellow slaves. That upset his sense of justice. That in reading this parable and understanding this parable, that should upset our sense of justice. We should be moved with anger toward this unmerciful slave as well. And, and so, being moved with anger, he pronounces judgment upon this slave. He says, you, you should have shown mercy. You should have been more cognizant of what I had done for you. Instead, this is what I'm going to do. Forget that I forgave your debt. Instead, I'm going to send you to the torturers until you repay all that is owed. I'll be completely honest, I, I don't know what the torturers are, what kind of culture is involved in that. All I know is that it wasn't pleasant. It would have been a, a very harsh life for this slave. And then we come to not technically part of the parable, but Jesus' conclusion on the matter. In verse 35, he says, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. He says, My heavenly Father will do the same to you. We have to ask ourselves, what is the same? What, what does he mean? Well, Coming back to verse 34, it says, His Lord, we could understand that as God, handed him the, the unmerciful slave, that's anyone who does not forgive his brother, handed him over to the torturers. Well, when we understand that hell is torment, that it is torture, perhaps that's what it means. That anyone who is unwilling to forgive his brother suffers the condemnation of hell where they will be tormented forever and ever, repaying their debt. Remember that this man could not have paid back that debt in his lifetime. It would have taken it 200,000 years. Well, that's forever and ever. Reminds me of what awaits those in hell, those who do not keep God's commandments. But another phrase that I want to note in what Jesus says, says, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. One could see that as an added stipulation. We're not just talking about, oh, well, fine. I'll just forget all about it, whatever. Yeah, I was pretty upset, and, and yeah, I, you know, I, I forgive you. I'm never going to talk to you again, but I forgive you. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, from your heart. Truly, Asking God to forgive that person and forgiving him in your own heart is what we're talking about here. Let's look at some applications from this parable. First, we want to understand that we are that slave. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be unmerciful. But that is the, the analogy that Jesus is making in this parable. And so if we understand ourselves to be in the position of that slave, 
then what we have to understand is we have a massive debt to God. Each and every one of us. An unpayable debt. That's our sin. We all have sinned and we all have done so much in transgression of God's commandments that we cannot possibly ever repay it. Secondly, we want to note that we are indeed to freely forgive because of what God has done for us. Because we understand that we were the ones who owed this massive debt that we could never ever repay, and yet God had mercy upon us. God said, you are freed and you are forgiven. And what that slave should have done is gone out and, and even if he wanted the, the other slave to repay him, when, when that slave showed the same humility and said the same exact words that he said, the unmerciful slave said to his master, what he should have done is forgiven him, realizing that he had just been forgiven a massive debt and he's forgiven such a small debt. When we think about those people who have wronged us in our lives, they have incurred a small debt to us, if you want to put it that way. What they've done to us is so small compared to what we have done to God and what God has forgiven us. And yet, so often we are unwilling to forgive but we should freely forgive because any amount that we could ever forgive from someone who has done something to us is so small compared to what God has forgiven us. Another point I want to make is that lack of forgiveness affects others. We talked about in, in the parable how the other slaves were deeply grieved tell you, when you start tearing apart your relationships with others, with, with other people, it's going to affect those around you. I know of two women who at one point were at great odds with each other. It started because one did not come to the party of another person's child. They were going to another party instead. And then words were exchanged and they started to, to get angry with each other. And, and, and basically it was said of, of one, uh, the, the person who, who felt offended, you know, you, you never come to, to anything. You, you're always about you, you, you all the time. And eventually it ended up with a rift. And they stopped talking to each other and seeing each other for years. Well, these people had mutual family, mutual friends. And so it happened that, you know, you're stuck between do I invite this person or do I invite this person? Because I can't have them in the same room. And you're left with People who are grieved because they see this relationship between two people and the lack of forgiveness, the lack of love between them. And it creates grief for everyone. And that's something that we need to understand. We don't just live in a bubble where I can just be mad at this person and, and that's all it affects me and them. No, it has a great effect on, on our other relationships as well. And even if you're super upset with someone, you need to consider the other people involved as well. The last thing that I, I put is that forgiveness is good for you, too. 
We understand that forgiveness is good for the person who's being forgiven, right? And the, the parable, of course, it was great for the, the slave who was forgiven that, that great debt. Yes. But with the application of, of what Jesus said, we understand that we won't be forgiven if we do not forgive. And so there's one way that forgiveness is good for us. We want to be forgiven by God of our, our debt, of our sin. That's true. But if you expand that out further, forgiveness is good for the soul. <clears throat> Look at how bitter that unmerciful slave was and the way that he was acting because he did not have mercy, because he did not have forgiveness in his heart. He acted like an animal. Seizing that other slave and choking him and saying, pay back what you owe me. When we keep bitterness in our hearts toward others, when we refuse to forgive we become ugly. We become people that, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't want to be. Forgiveness is indeed good for the soul. Because what we're doing with forgiveness is we're letting go of those things and we're letting God be the judge. We're not judge. We're not jury. We're not executioner. That doesn't belong to us. If we take on a role that we are, are not made for, then that becomes a problem. Borrowing from Mark, what he said a couple weeks ago, you need to stay in your own lane. That's not your job, it's God's job. And so all we are doing when we are forgiving is saying that's not for me to decide, but rather that is something between you and God. When somebody is, is penitent, we, we forgive them, we move on, and we let that be between them and God, what ultimately matters. I hope that this study this morning has been beneficial to you. And I hope that it is highlighted that we all need forgiveness. We know we do. As we talked about this morning in Bible class, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. We all need forgiveness of sins. If you have not obeyed the gospel this morning, your sins have not been forgiven. But believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing his name before men, and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, you can have that forgiveness that you need. If you are a Christian, and perhaps you have turned back to sin, the book of 1 John says that if you confess your, confess your sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Forgiveness is attainable even then. If you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?